All right. God bless you, ladies. I'm excited to share this with you. It's so amazing. So I, I'm going to ask you to please stay on. It might be a little bit long, but it's worth it. So stay on, girls, and uh, read with me. So we're going to share. Last week, Delilah shared on the Last Supper, and tonight we are continuing on what follows next, which is the agony and the betrayal of of Jesus Christ at the garden. So everything since the beginning in Genesis, in the first garden, the Garden of Eden, where the Father promised that he would crush Satan's head, since then, everything in history, in all the history of the Bible, was leading to this hour. The hour where Jesus is starting to fulfill that promise that the Father made to Satan in the first garden. When he told Satan that, uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall crush your head and you will bruise his heel. So starting in the garden of, now in the garden of Gethsemane, the son of God is betrayed into the hands of sinners. But all of Jesus' human life, all of his life was pointing to this hour. Everything he poured into his disciples Every kindness as he healed the blind, the mute, the lame, setting the demon possessed free, even raising the dead. It was all leading to this hour of him defeating and crushing Satan by means of him being crushed by the Father. But he was always preparing for this hour, even as early as uh John 2, when Jesus turned water into wine, he said, my hour has not yet come, John 2, 4. When he came up to to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths, he said, my hour has not yet come in John 7 and 6. And when he began teaching publicly, it was not long before they were seeking to arrest him. But no one laid a hand on him because, John 7.30, it says, because his hour had not yet come. And then again in John 8, in the holy city, he was teaching in the temple, and they were seeking to arrest him, but no one arrested him. Again, John explains, because his hour had not yet come in John 8.20. But when Jesus finally came to Passover week, he knew that at last his hour has come. Jesus said in John twelve twenty seven. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. And he started to prepare his disciples, getting them, um, getting them now that telling him that, uh, explaining to them that he's going to die. So he tells them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John twelve twenty three. When Jesus reclined with his disciples in the upper room to prepare them for his departure, he knew this was the hour. As he began his high priestly prayer that Thursday night, he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify the Son, that the Son may glorify you in John 17, verse 1. He told his disciples, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This meant he knew this was the hour of his betrayal from his friends, who we know as Judas. Which was, which was prophesied hundreds of years before in Psalms 41, where it says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. 
on Psalms 41, verse 9. And both would die on trees that day, one hung from a tree and one on the cross. Um, they had they had a friendship by over three years. They ate together, they laughed together, they pro- proclaimed the kingdom together, even cast out demons together, battled with the Pharisees together. together. So heaven, heaven's king invited Judas to be part of his team, to be part of his ministry, the 12 disciples. In John 6, 70, Jesus answered, answered them and said, Did I not chose you, the 12, and yet one of you is the devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon the Scariot, for one of the 12 was going to betray him. Then John 13 I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture will be fulfilled. So night and day, this man followed and fellowshiped with his creator. And both died on trees that day. Both were cursed of God. Galatians 3.13 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. We know Judas was a lover of money. He was the money keeper or the treasurer. So still mad at Mary that she had poured out the expensive oil upon Jesus' feet in John 12, 3, instead of giving it to him so he could steal some before passing it to the rest of the poor. He went to Jesus' enemies and sold him for a slave price of 30 pieces of silver as it was foretold in Zechariah 11, verse 12, and in Matthew 26, 14. So Jesus was troubled in his spirit, and he told them one final time, one of you will betray me, in John 13, 21. So we see the anguish that Jesus is feeling, and it was foretold in Psalm 55, verse 12. It says, it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. Psalm 55, 12. That night, the table was set for his last supper, the night of his betrayal. His betrayal has arrived. Uh, Jesus, having loved them with a perfect love, now loved them to the end. John 13, 1. He rose from the table knowing that his death is approaching. He wrapped a towel around his waist and bent low to wash his disciples' feet. John 13, 5. So with clean feet, Judas goes and betrays him. But Jesus was no hypocrite. He said, I say to to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. That's Luke 6, 27. Knowing all along who Judas was, from the beginning, Jesus knew whom he chose. Jesus said, did I not chose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is the devil, John 6, 70. That night he said, not all of you will be cleansed of sin, for I know whom I have chosen, John 13, 18. After he spoke about this with so much pain in his spirit about the betrayal, John gives us the the response of the disciples. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke, John 13, They all looked at each other's eyes thinking, how could the devil sit among us? So now instead of wondering who's the greatest, they now finally recognize the fact that a devil has been eating, sleeping, ministering among them. And none pointed to Judas. No one whispered, I knew it, it was Judas. Nobody grabbed his sword to cut off his ear. Instead, they asked Jesus one by one, 
Is it me? Is it I? In Mark 14, each saw as much darkness in themselves as Jesus saw in Judas. But he strengthened his disciples. He encouraged them, telling them what's about to happen to him. In John 14, 30, he says, I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler, the ruler of this world is coming, Satan. He has no claim on me. As the Father has commanded, I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So rise and let us go from here. So they have been in the upper room until now. The Lord, the Lord's Supper is over. The foot washing is over. Satan entered into Judas. We know, and we know this from Luke 22 and 3. But not before Jesus gives him permission. Jesus had to give him permission to go and betray him. John 13, 27. Then after he had taken the, the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, go do and do it quickly. So Judas is on his way. Satan is on his way. He's coming and now he's saying to his disciples, let's go. And when he says let's go, he means the Garden of Gethsemane, which means olive press, where he is starting to be pressed and crushed where he plans to be arrested and taken to execution, to be crucified. But before they get to Gethsemane, he wants them to see, he wants the disciples to see for their faith that there is something that he wants them to believe about this night. He wants to remove some wrong understanding about what's happening and get the right understanding. He wants them to know that the devil is real and that he is active, but in a sense, he's powerless. So let's read carefully again, John 14 and 30. The ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So Jesus is saying that Satan is not why he's going to the cross. This is what he wants them, what he wants to straighten out for them. That Satan tonight is not the reason because he is telling them in John 14, 30, he has no claim on me. What does this mean? It means he has nothing on me. The great accuser has nothing to accuse Jesus with. And he's been searching and looking, and he can't find anything in Jesus to accuse him with. There's not even a little sin to hook Jesus with. That happens with us, with me, with you. If we think a a sinful thought, he hooks us. If we have a sinful feeling, he hooks us. But Satan has no power over a sinless man. None at all. So he wants them to know that this night, the reason why he is getting arrested and why he is going to the cross, why he is going through so much sorrow, is not Satan. Not at all. Why is he getting arrested? Arrested is, this is what he wants them to understand. That, and he tells us really plainly why he's going to get arrested and suffer and why he's so sorrowful and why he's going to die. He tells them, Satan has nothing on me. He can't hook me. He can't control me. He can't find even a little crack of sin in my, in my righteousness, in my suit of righteousness. But here's the truth. He's saying, I'm going by obedience to my father. That's why I'm getting arrested. This is not a demonic plan. He wants them to know this is divine compliance 
with the will of the Almighty God to save sinners. And he wants us to know this, too, so that we can trust him. This is all about him choosing to die, choosing to get arrested, choosing to suffer, to be obedient to his father. And Satan may think that he is running the show. He doesn't run the show. Satan is God's sheepdog. Every shepherd has a sheepdog. And Jesus has him on a leash to accomplish his purpose. Just like he did with Job. Satan needed permission permission to, to touch Job. And then he asked to sift Peter. Jesus did not give permission to sift Peter. But instead he prays for him for him, for his fate not to fail. Satan cannot do anything without permission from Jesus, especially to go into Judas to betray him. He could not do anything until Jesus told him, what you have to do, go do it and do it quickly. So we go to Daniel 14.35. It says, he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Daniel 4.35. And Isaiah 46.10 says, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purposes, Isaiah 46, 10. And Lamentations 3, 37 says, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Lord most high that good and bad come? Uh, Proverbs 19.21, many other plans of a, plans in the minds of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand, Proverbs 19.21. So Satan is not the explanation for Judah's betrayal. Uh, it is not the explanation for the cross of, of Calvary. That's what he wants them to know. But love and submission and obedience to the Father is the explanation for the betrayal, the agony in the garden and then and the cross. John 10, Jesus is saying, I do as my Father has commanded me. Rise, let us, let, let us go. Nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. And if I lay it down, I will take it up again. So Satan, do as you are told and do it quickly. So Judas is on his way, and they're on their way to the garden. So when Jesus gets to Gethsemane, the gospel writers made it clear that Jesus knew all things that would come upon him. Nothing that night was accident. Nothing took him by surprise. He was fully aware of everything that was happening. Nothing was out of his hand and the Father's control. <clears throat> this also means that Jesus understood fully before he ever set foot in the garden. He knew the awful truth about what he would have to endure. <clears throat> One second, let me drink something. <clears throat> so he he knew what he would have to endure, but he was prepared to submit himself completely and holding nothing back from the Father's will in order to accomplish the eternal plan of redemption. <clears throat> in his prayer that night in the garden, he struggled to cope with these issues, with these issues, he's uh, struggling with the terrifying reality of what he was about to endure. Here we have an amazing window into the heart of Jesus that night. 
by the time Jesus reached Gethsemane with his disciples, it had to have been late or at least around midnight. All of them were tired. It was the end of the hectic week and the close of a very busy day. But Christ had, uh, he had business that night in the garden that was more important than sleep and nothing, nothing would hinder him from going there to pray. Jesus was fully human in every sense. He felt the same physical emotions that are common to us as humans. He also felt tired. He knew what it was to be hungry, thirsty, like a normal, normal person. He also experienced the full range of human emotions. At times we see him uh, crying, mourning, being mad, mad at the Pharisees. And he also rejoiced when sinners converted. He was fully human like us in every way except for our sinfulness. So during his prayer that night in the garden, every sorrow he had ever known seemed to hit him all at once. No one but no one except God the Father knew how alone and how in agony Christ felt he felt in that dark hour. Jesus knew he had to go to the cross and he had to do it alone. But he kept coming back to his disciples and waking them up from their sleep, telling them, can't you stay up and watch and pray with me just for an hour? Matthew 26. We sometimes feel or say, the weight of the world, we say we feel like the weight of the world is upon our shoulders, or sometimes we say that. I feel like the weight of the world is on me. But not even a drop compares to what Jesus suffered all that night and that day. Only Jesus really had the weight of the world or the sins of the world on his shoulders. And what is more is that he knew that he would be separated from the Father. That's what hurted him more. And that the Father would forsake him and not look upon him for a few hours, only for a few hours. This was separation anxiety to the point of death. Habakkuk Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes are too pure to look upon sin. And I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 5.21 where it says, He who knew no sin became sin. That's why on the cross he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he cannot look upon sin. From eternity past, Christ has been in complete communion with the Father at all times, and to know he would soon be uh, apart from him brought him to the point of death because of the shame of our sin that was upon him. He was overwhelmed. Jesus was overwhelmed just by that alone, knowing that he would be separated for a few hours from the Father. So in the garden, we truly see Jesus' humanity, although he knew in the end that he would be resurrected and that he would ascend to the Father's right hand again. Just the thought of going to the, so the thought of going to the cross and being separated from God caused an unimagine, unimaginable sorrow. Lamentations 1 12 describes some of the sorrow that Christ uh, went through and the affliction that um, from the hand of his father. And it says, it is nothing to you, all you that pass by. Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord had afflicted me. 
in the day of his fierce anger. So never was so much sorrow inflicted on one person, on one individual. We could never even comprehend the deepness of Christ's agony that he went through that night, just in the garden. That night, because really, we cannot even perceive it. We cannot understand it. The wickedness of sin as, uh, we cannot understand the wickedness of sin as he could, nor can we really comprehend the terrors, terrors of divine wrath the way he did. The sorrow he expressed in the garden uh, prayer is therefore beyond our compre- comprehension. So here is um, Matthew's account of what happened that night. Matthew, we're going to read Matthew 26, 36 through 44. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even until death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, Oh, my father, if it is possible, Let this cup pass away from me. Unless I drink it, your your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same words, let this cup pass away from me. So we see three views of Christ incomprehensible struggle. And uh, in this passage, we see his sorrow, his supplication, and his submission. The Lord's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane is only second to his suffering on the cross of Calvary. As the Lord anticipated The horror of the cross, he said to his disciples, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. We can't even imagine. Our minds cannot conceive what kind of anguish, what kind of sorrow he is going through while he's praying. While he's praying in this garden, those words, exceedingly sorrowful, literally means to be grieved all around. The Lord expressed here that he was surrounded with sorrow while there in the garden praying. In his great anguish, the Lord longed for the presence of Peter, James, and John. He wanted them to watch and pray and stay awake with him as he suffered. We read in Matthew 26, 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And Luke 24, 41 tells us that Christ kneeled down and prayed. Matthew tells us he fell on his face. So if we consider both of these accounts, we can picture the Lord falling to his knees and on his face as he 
as he is in great agony and he's lifted up his voice to his father as he prayed, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. So was he, was there another way? Was it possible for God to save sinful sinners without the Lord experiencing the wrath of Almighty God? and dying on the cross for us? Could we be saved without a sin bearer? No. The answer is no. There was no other way. Maybe this prayer was for us. Could it be that the the Lord Jesus prayed this prayer so that we might realize that there was no other possible way? He kept on praying. If it is possible, let this cup So maybe he prayed this prayer for us to realize that there was no possible way for the salvation except through his own suffering and death on the cross and and resurrection from the grave. And maybe that is why he kept coming back to the disciples. Even though Jesus left most of the disciples at the entrance, He went inside to pray with Peter, John, and James. These three disciples are the inner circle among the disciples. Jesus often allowed the three of them to go with him on special occasions when the other disciples was not permitted to follow. That's what it says in Mark 5, 37 and Matthew 17, 1. Uh, Why did he bring these three? Mostly for their benefit. They were privileged to be witnesses to Christ's struggle and suffering and sorrow in his darkest hour of his trial. And from his example, they would learn a great lesson in how to handle affliction. And even though they kept on falling asleep, they witnessed enough to see that even the all-powerful, sinless Son of God felt such a great need for prayer, especially that night. And yet his weak disciples apparently had no sense of desperate need to pray that hour. So they they were like all deaf to what he had told them all that day. And everything... That would, that would happen that night. But this is typical of a sinful heart. In our fleshly and fallen state, we are forgetful to our own spiritual poverty and weakness. Yet even in his sinlessness, Christ was very aware of the weakness of human flesh. And he could not sleep when the need for communion with God was so urgent. The disciples, on the other hand, all fell asleep at their post. How could they fall asleep? Knowing everything that he had told them, maybe they were feeling safe in a familiar environment. Probably no one else ever came to this place at night, forgetting that one of their own would be the betrayer. They imagined that they were safe, and so they fell asleep, leaving Jesus to bear his anguish and his suffering, his sorrow all alone. That's why Jesus tells them in Matthew twenty six forty one, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus taking our place taking the blame for the sins that we so easily fall into, he alone was bearing the divine wrath of God that night. The stress that he felt that night was so severe that he had that it had brought him to the very point of death. The agony that he bore in the garden was literally enough to kill him. And it may well have done so, 
if God was not preserving him for another means of death. So God the Father sends an angel to provide him just enough strength to keep him alive until the cross. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and yet still he sweated great drops of blood. Luke 22:44 said that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That describes a rare condition known as hematidrosis. Hematidrosis. And that happens under heavy emotional stress and sorrow and distress, where the blood vessels burst under the stress and the blood mingles with the one's perspiration through the sweat glands, causing sweat, sweating to be uh, blood, to be great drops of blood. So why was he feeling such agony? And it might seem natural to, to, for us to assume that it was, that he was dreading or fearing the physical pain of the cross and the tortures that he was about to suffer because he knew all of this. Or all the pain that he would go through on the way to the cross. But we know that many before him went to the cross and have suffered crucifixion without sweating blood, just at the thought of it. So it is hard to think that the Son of God would be suffering such agony for fear of what men could do to him. He himself had uh, taught his disciples, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, in Matthew 10.28. So for sure, It was not death that troubled his soul so violently. After all, the reason he became human was to come to die because God cannot die. This was the hour for which he had come into this world. It is hard to think that he would have second thoughts about dying at this stage. John 12, 27 says in an earlier prayer of Jesus that he was that it was spoken in public in which he said now my soul is troubled and what shall I say father save me from this hour but for this purpose I have came to this hour but here in the garden he prays oh my father if it is possible let this cup pass from me So is he having second thoughts about dying? Is he praying to be delivered from the tortures of the cross? And the answer is not at all. The Apostle John said when Jesus is being arrested and Peter tries to use his sword to stop the arrest, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its case. Shall I not drink of the cup which my father has given me? In John 18, 11. And Matthew 26, 53 says, do you, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it but must be so? So it is clear that the Father did give Jesus the cup to drink, after all. So what is the cup? Uh, The cup that he was fearing? What was this cup that he was fearing? It was not merely death. It was not physical pain of the cross. It was not the scourging, the humiliation, the horrible thirst the torture or having nails through his body, through his hands, or being spat upon or pulling his beard off his face or wearing the poisonous crown on his head or being beaten beyond recognition. It was not even all those things combined. All those things were the very things Christ himself 
said not to fear. Jesus said in Luke 12, 4, and I say to you, my friend, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that have no more that they can do to you in Luke 12. But he went on to say, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him in verse 5. So clearly what Christ is dreading most about the cup from which he acts to be delivered, if it is possible, was the outpouring of divine wrath that he would have to endure from his Holy Father. The cup was well known in the Old Testament. It was a symbol of divine wrath against sin. Isaiah fifty five seventeen says, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the drags of the cup of trembling and drained it out. And Jer- Jeremiah twenty five twenty seven Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink of this cup and be drunk and vomit. Fall and rise no more because of the sword that I am sending among you. And if they refuse to accept the cup from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, you must drink it. So the cup symbolizes, and they knew back then that that meant divine judgment. And it is found throughout the, all the, throughout the Old Testament and Lamentations, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, that speaks about the cup as divine judgment and wrath. So when Christ prayed in the garden, if it is possible that the cup might be passed from him, He spoke of drinking the cup of divine wrath and judgment against sin. Do not imagine for a moment that Christ feared the earthly pain of crucifixion. He would not sweat drops of blood in fear at the thought of what men could do to him. There was not one ounce of fear of man in him. It was knowing that the next day he would bear the sins of many, Hebrews 9.28, and the full force of divine wrath that would fall upon him. And in some mysterious way, that hour, our human mind, that hour, our human mind could never fathom. We cannot understand. And we cannot understand that God the Father would turn his face from Christ the Son. And Christ would have to bear the full force of divine fury against sin. Remember Isaiah 53 and 10 says, It pleased the Lord to crush him, and he has put him to grief. When Jesus was sweating blood, drops of blood, he was starting to bear the sins of his people. And he was suffering the wrath of God on our behalf. This was the beginning of the of the pains that of the wrath of God. Second Corinthians says that He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians five twenty one. This birth has brought about a lot of debate among the theologians. Over the years, there is no doubt that this verse expresses a unique truth about Jesus, where it says, he became sin for us. While on the other, well, on the other hand, the verse is explaining the simple gospel truth. But Jesus took upon himself the sin of all the world, all the ones that would believe in him. 
So how exactly did God make Jesus to be sin for us? So the best way to understand he became sin for us is to begin with what uh, it does not mean. First, it does not mean that Jesus actually became sin itself. To say such thing denies all of Scripture, which clearly presents Jesus as the one in whom there is no sin in John 3, 5, who commits no sin, 1 Peter 2, 22, and who is holy and blameless and pure, Mark 1, 24, Acts 3, Revelation 3, 7. For Jesus to become sin even for a moment would mean that he ceased to be God. But uh, scripture presents Jesus as the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13 and 8. He was and is and always will be the second person of the Godhead, John 1, 1. Second, the idea that Jesus became sin for us does not mean that he became a sinner, not even for a moment. Some have said that Christ may be considered as the greatest sinner because of all the sins of mankind, or at least the elect, because his own, his, because his own sins, when Christ suffered in our place and died for us because of our own sin, he bore the punishment for our sin in his own body. Second Peter 2.24. But Jesus at no time became a sinner personally. Third, it does not mean that he was guilty of actual sin. Not one is truly, no one is truly guilty who has not transgressed uh, the law of God, which Jesus never did. If he were guilty, then he would be deserving to die a death that could have, and he would have no more merit than that of any one of us. Even the Pharisees who who sent Jesus to the cross knew that he was guiltless. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of that, they still asked Pilate to have him executed. Acts 13. He became sin for us does not mean that Jesus was sin or a sinner or guilty of sin. The proper interpretation can only be found in the doctrine of imputation. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, our sin was imputed to Christ. That is how Christ paid for our sin debt to God. He had no sin in himself, but our sin was imputed to him. To him, so as he suffered, he took the just penalty that our sin deserves. At the same time, through faith, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. And now we stand before God sinless and righteous just as Jesus is sinless and righteous. It doesn't mean that we are righteous in ourselves. The Bible says that our righteousness is filthy rags. Rather, His, Christ's righteousness, is applied to us. So God made him to be sin for us means that Jesus, although sinless, was treated as if if he were a sinner. Although he remained holy, he was regarded as guilty of all the sins of the elect. Through imputation of our sin to him and he became our substitute and receiver of God's judgment against sin, sin, having saved those who believe. He is now our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30 
So why should this matter to you? It should matter because if God were not the main actor in the death of Jesus, then the death of Jesus could not save us from our sin, and we would perish in hell forever, Matthew 25, 46. The reason the death of Christ is the heart of the gospel, the heart of the good news, is that God was doing it. God the Father planned it. He was doing it out of love for his chosen ones. God planned and ordained all of it, and Jesus fulfills it. Romans 5, 8. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you separate God's, God the Father's activity from the death of Jesus, we lose the gospel. This was all God's doing. It is all the highest and deepest, the deepest point of his love for sinners, for sinners. His love for you and for me. Romans 8.3, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. God condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. Our condemnation so we can be free. Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. God the Father cursed Jesus with the curse that belonged on us. But we are free. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. God was wounded. God wounded him and crushed him for you and for me. And we can be free, also that we can be free. Because God cannot die. Jesus needed a body to be able to die, to be able to feel, to be able to feel the sorrow and all the suffering, to take away sin. That's why he became human. Hebrews 10 uh, verse 5 says, When Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and in <clears throat> sin offerings, you have not taken no pleasure. Then I say, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. He had no pleasure in burnt offerings, in the blood of lambs and bulls and goats, but he had pleasure in crushing the sun. Because sin needed to be dealt with in the flesh. For the wages of sin is death. And what is sin? Sin is belittle, belittle, <laughs> belittling the glory of God. Sin is belittling the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And uh, Romans 3.10, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not even one. Romans 1.23. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, birds, animals, creeping things, which is exactly what Judas did, exchanging the glory of God for 30 pieces of silver. He was a lover of money, even though he seen the glory of God. He was with him for 30, for three years of his ministry. He seen all of the miracles and even Gave, and he was even given authority to do miracles. Jesus here shows us that religious associations or religious 
practices, even during doing the miracles, are not sure evidences of being born again. And Matthew 10, 1 through 4 talks about that. The choosing uh, of, of the 12, including Judas, and it says, Jesus gave them, including Jews, Judas, the authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction, Matthew 10, verse 1. So Judas walked with Jesus, ministered with Jesus and with the disciples for three years and worked all of the same miracles. So if you really look at it, Judas becomes a real illustration of the people in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, where it says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? That's Judas. And many, many other people in the history. And then Jesus will declare to them and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity and lawlessness. So we see that religious activity and miracle miracle working, we cast out demons in your name, we healed people in your name. They, that proves nothing about having saving faith and being born again. So just how could Judas betray the king of kings after all he's seen and heard? Uh, just, uh, just goes to show you that it doesn't matter. If God himself is sitting right next to you, if the Lord doesn't open your eyes spiritually, you will never understand, you will never recognize him for who he truly is. And Judas teaches us that sinners need more than a good example to be saved. Judas had the best example who ever lived, Jesus himself. But he was still dead in his trespasses and sin, like Ephesians uh, 2 1 says. Unless the Holy Spirit gives us or imputes to us new life. Sinners are, are not capable even of repenting of sin or believing in Christ or changing their lifestyle if God doesn't open their eyes spiritually or grants them repentance. That's why Jesus uh, told Nicodemus in uh, John 3, 7, Don't, Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. And Nicodemus was also a well-known religious leader. But like Judas, there are those today who have spent time surrounded by believers who may be involved in ministry, who might, they might even have titles, and yet don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. But we all all of us fall short of the glory of God. We, like Judas, just like Judas, we want to kiss the Lord. We kiss the Lord in worship. But then when times get tough, we dishonor him by denying him like Peter did. The only difference is him, Jesus, choosing to have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Matthew uh, 15 verse 8 says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. In vain do they worship me. And we all have exchanged the glory of God for images. Every time we sin, every time choras, every time chokhavas, and we do that without even thinking about it, Every day. That's why we deserved the wrath of God. And that cup that he gave to Jesus, that cup was meant for us. But he became our substitute. He took our place. He took the place for his elect. 
witnessed and received all of God's judgment against sin, having saved those who believe in him. And he is now our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. And we should treasure, really treasure that above everything else in this life. So that is our study for tonight. And I hope you enjoyed it and I pray that you will meditate on it, study it for yourself. And uh, I guess that's it. So, Father, I 